Thanks for coming to my talk. First, I'd like to say that I work for the Max Planck Computing and Data Facility, so in short, MPCDF, which is a cross-institutional competence center of the Max Planck Society. So we collaborate with the scientists from different Max Planck Institute uh, um, uh, society to support them uh, from the high-performance computing point of view and for data science as well. Max Planck uh, uh, Computing and Data Facility is involved in the <coughs> development of um, application and algorithm for high performance computing as well as for data intensive, for implementing and designing a solution for data intensive uh, project. So, <coughs> not only operates the state of art of uh, supercomputers, but also provide up to date infrastructures for data management or long term archival. In collaboration with one of these institute, to be precise, the Max Planck uh, Full Eyes of Forschung Centrum in Dusseldorf, we are working in the so-called uh, big data driven material science uh, domain. And in particular, I'm uh, supporting them in the emerging, emerging area of uh, atom probe crystallography. So their goal is to reveal both structures and composition of uh, crystals and basically they ask us to perform Fourier transforms of large data set. By large I mean something like billions of atoms inside a crystal. They plan to retrieve high quality um, crystalline data and iterat iteratively apply Fourier transform which is imperative if you are interested in looking forward to high quality sub volumes and this um, cycle of operations helps you to uh, improve and reconstruct the um, parameters useful for the atom probe tomography. This requires state of the art of data mining and visualization. The Fourier transform or scattering maps for uh, uh, nanostructures in principle can be computed with the formula in the upper box as long as the electron or atomic um, or nuclear density is well defined on a grid fine enough to resolve atomic position R inside a crystal. So you can solve basically the uh, Fourier transform either by using the well-known algorithm of a fast Fourier transform which is pretty fast, scales like n log n and well uh, suitable for um, large crystalline structures or by direct calculations, which it's a bit slower, but we prefer to follow this uh, way because it's the most general case. In principle, you can compute the amplitude of a scattering maps starting from the atomic position and scattering factors inside the crystals. From any structure model, I mean, it can be also ideal or non-ideal case. The crystal can present some deformation, some tension, tension, some strain. So that's why it's very useful to compute discrete Fourier transform by direct calculations. Just to give you some numbers, usually we have uh, to do with uh, a lot of atoms. I've, as I said, billions of atoms. So let, in this presentation, I'm showing results based on 10 to the 8 atoms. The reciprocal or lattice space denoted by HKL usually requires a very fine resolution. So let's say 10 to the uh, uh, 6. To, uh, ten, to, ten, yes. And so in terms of floating point operations, you have 10 to the 8 times to 10 to the 6 times 10, which accounts the floating point operation uh, due to the algebraic operations involved in Fourier transform. Essentially, you are evaluating a sinus and cosinus function. So in general, you end up with 10 to the 15 flop, which is a very <laughs> huge number. But compared to the peak performances of modern architectures, it seems this algorithm is well suited for uh, GPU computation, which has um, 10 to the 13 flo floating point operations per seconds. And I'm going to show you 
uh, how this algorithm scales perfectly on multiple GPUs on a computation time of order of uh, minutes. So what we are doing at the MPCDF, not cooking perfect blue crystals, no worry. And uh, first, why GPU programming in combination with uh, uh, high-level language, uh, high-level scripting languages like uh, Python? It, um, they are polar opposite. GPU parallel programming are highly parallel, very sensitive to the architecture, to the hardware. They are built to optimize the um, floating point memory throughput in order to give you a, a tremendous high performance when you address your uh, scientific task. On the other hand, the Python uh, is in favor of a, a easy use, um, favor ease of use, but <coughs> PyCUDA aims to join together these two aspects. PyOpenCL is same, uh, similar philosophy and can be considered a sort of a sister project, but for the rest of the talk, I'm just referring to PyCUDA. And why Python? Well, not only is uh, easy and user-friendly, uh, easy to learn, general purpose, but <coughs> okay, and uh, <coughs> it's very valuable to, for the scientific community because it contains a lot of uh, uh, packages very useful for addressing your scientific uh, uh, task, and this. Um, allows you to write your code in a dozen of lines instead of hundreds or even more in other um, programming languages. And especially this avoids to reinvent the wheel any time. It uh, excels in the displaying your data since a scientific vi uh, visualization is an um, essential part in a scientific um, process. And NumPy, uh, which is a foundational package for uh, scientific computing, it gives you powerful n-dimensional array, uh, broadcasting function, optimi optimized uh, um, linear algebra, Fourier transforms algorithm, and tools to integrating C and C++ and Fortran code. Perhaps the most simple uh, and useful program you can write in PyCUDA is simple to multiply by two element wise your uh, four times four array. Two things, you import PyCUDA driver as CUDA, CUDA alias, and then gives you access to driver level uh, CUDA interface. Then import PyCUDA auto init because automatically picks the GPU available up and run on it. And then simple, you define your four times four um, matrices. You allocate memory on the device. By device, I mean the GPU. And literally, host to device, transfer your num NumPy array to the device. And now, um, in the um, red box, the most interesting part, you have a, a purely CUDA C uh, code wrapped in Python. So. Essentially, this code executes on the device, and then it's called within and from an existing Python code. The same results can be obtained with much less effort using GPU arrays, since PyCUDA offers abstractions, and so the GPU equivalent of NumPy array. So in agreement with the edit, run, repeat style, uh, PyCUDA has a two-fold uh, aim. First, it aims to simply usage existing CUDA C and uh, wrapping um, this CUDA C, avoid to reinvent basics of uh, GPU programming, or in, and on top of the first layer, uh, PyCUDA um, offer abstractions. So <coughs> PyCUDA, gives you easy, complete, and uh, um, Pythonic access to the GPU. So this uh, guarantees uh, automatic uh, resource management and error checking. Convenience, in sense they provide abstractions, as I uh, showed you before, and tightly integration, tight integration with Umpair Array. Of course, it's fast, and there's a, a very well documentation. Here, just some reporting uh, 
uh, some links where you can uh, uh, get more information about Pi CUDA. What are we using to analyze our uh, crystals? We are using Pi NX, which stands for Tools for Nanostructures Crystallography. It's an open source library. Uh, the author is Vincent Fev Nicoli, and that uh, the code has been developed at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. I'm just in talking about the main modules uh, in charge of uh, uh, computing X-ray scattering by getting uh, benefits of using uh, uh, graphical processing, uh, processing units. Just to, be, uh, to give a complete overview, I'm just enumerating the remaining modules, but these are not touched in the rest of the discussion. So the main aim of PineX is to give a large ensemble of atoms let's say billions of atoms, to compute a Fourier transform in one, two, or three D uh, coordinates in the reciprocal space with very uh, fine resolution using the um, performances of GPUs. The high performance uh, can be uh, obtained by using either NVIDIA cool, uh, Toolkit, and so as uh, along with PyCode library, or as I said, with OpenCL, with PyOpenCL. At MPCDF, the um, default em Python environment is provided by Anaconda Distributions. PyNX support Python version 2.7 and above. It can be simply downloaded by the website project. You can ask for an account and become a developer, or simply pip install PyNX. It's uh, required to have PyCuda, of course, if you, if you want to run on GPU, and NumPy, Matplotlib, if you want to display, uh, display data. PyNX, if GPU are not available, can run on CPU as well, so it's recommended to load, uh, to import PyFFTW package, and op optionally, you can uh, use some external library the CCTBX library, which stands for uh, Crystal Computational Toolbooks, and likely you can install with Conda uh, under your Python distribution. What, what makes PyNX uh, very valuable is you can uh, simply use the Python interface. You don't need to learn CUDA. I've just finished to say you don't need to learn CUDA, and then I'm showing a, a CUDA uh, piece of code, but uh, at least it's um, useful and nice to have a, a view of what's going on. Essentially, CUDA FHKL is your device kernel. You have a device kernel for each module in the PyNX library. A couple of remarks. You are uh, index, um, index, indexing uh, array by combining threads and uh, multi-threads and block. For each block, you are allocated a shared memory because threads are better for uh, communication and synchronization. For global memory, you are transferring your input data to the shared memory, so threads on single blocks have access to uh, the, the same portion of the data. And uh, importantly, you have each tree to compute each single reflection and also, uh, you have fast and optimized the trigonometric function. This is just the continuum to take care of the, the remaining of uh, the atoms included in your data sets. And now, finally, to Python interface. Simple, you read your data. Uh, essentially, our data providers, they um, give us this uh, weird file extension .pos, which is essentially made of uh, four columns, x, y, and z, atomic uh, coordinates, and the fourth column is the mass to, uh, to charge ratio, which helps to identify different atomic spaces in your uh, input data file. It's a good habit to convert real uh, nanometers units in some adimensional units called fractional coordinates, which depends on the crystal uh, uh, you are um, exploring. And you can define your um, reciprocal 3D space, HKL, and run your um, 
function, FHKL treat, to compute the, the, um, the Fourier transform. The, the, number, the, the name of the GPU cards available is passed by command line, and you can choose whatever you have. For instance, at the MPCDF, I'm running on a Maxwell architecture, which is very performant. And essentially, what is computing, computed is the formula in the box, discrete Fourier transform, distributed on uh, several GPU. And what it returns is uh, a tuple, a, com a complex NumPy array FHKL, and also the computation time, which is nice sometimes, especially at the beginning when you want to perform some uh, speed test. This is just to give an example of what you can um, get or you can uh, display, for, uh, for instance, on the left is in HL uh, plane, you um, are showing a contour plot of scattering maps for a monotomic cubic structures under tube cells. In this case, you can also appreciate the, the fact that I'm working with the non-ideal structures. You can see a, a slight um, uh, um, offsets along the vertical direction. On the right is just to um, compute the complex uh, uh, refraction index in terms of the scattering angle. Some performances. On the left is what I run on our infrastructures. Uh, as I say, the, the Pascal archi uh, Maxwell architecture, the GTX 980. So you are varying the number of uh, grid points in the um, reciprocal space and as well the number of atoms. And please compare with the plot reported in the seminal paper where for the first time Pionix has been introduced to the scientific community. Nowadays we can reach throughput per GPU of order of four times 10 to the 11 reflections per atom per seconds. More benchmarks, uh, please um, pay attention that on the vertical axis it's on logarithmic scale. And this is the difference in computation time by running PyNX on a GPU and on 64 logical CPU. For instance, looking at the bar charts in the middle, Using a resolution of 64 cubes in the reciprocal space, you can r make your computation in roughly five minutes compared to two hours on a CPU. So there is a kind of a, a factor of 24 between the two. Here, just to make more example on um, new generation of a GPU, in this case is a Pascal architecture. In fact, between the Maxwell and Pascal architecture, you gain a roughly a fact, um, half an hour, for instance, in the most extreme resolution case. And this is how we deploy uh, our data, data science project. Basically, we submit your, uh, my, uh, our job on um, the um, supercomputing cluster. And in the box is just a, a small script how to use submit your job, because it used the Slurm workload uh, manager. Now, you have uh, raw data, and, in, and uh, you would like to convert it in a form which is viewable and understandable to humans. You, you want to visualize your data, because it's important as well. First, we are going to use a scikit image, which is a, a collection of uh, uh, algorithms for image processing, developed by the SciPy community and written in the Python language. Especially, I'm using the merging cubes algorithms, which iterates across your data volume, trying to find the regions which match with the, your isosurface value. So in the end, what's the, the goal? You have a data volume, and from this 3D cube, you want to extract a surface of equal value, uh, isosurface. So it takes two input um, parameters, the data volume called PowSpec, which is the uh, scattering amplitude essentially computed with PyNX, and the value you are choosing. 
but to be more interactive with the visualization is convenient to use VTK, the Visualization Toolkit, which is an um, open source software for computer graphics, image processing, scientific visualization. It's a collection of a C++ library, but well also um, a rapid in Python, for instance. So what we need to do is to convert our 3D NumPy array given back by, by PyNX in a VTK XML-based format. And I'm going to use PyAVTK, which is very uh, easy to use uh, Python um, library uh, package. It, it saves NumPy array straights in your VTK XML based. So once you have this VTK XML uh, file, you can process these uh, files using one of uh, the most common applications like uh, Visit, Mojave, or Paraview. We are using Paraview as our main workhorses for 3D analysis. Paraview, it's an um, open source, multi-platform, uh, perfectly uh, scalable, um, for, uh, useful for visual, visualizing huge amount of data in 2D and in 3D. It's uh, scalable in the sense you can run from your notebook up to your um, cluster or distributed memory uh, supercomputers. Has an intuitive user interface. And when you are doing with the scientific visualization, uh, you need data with a well, um, well done spatial uh, representation. So the data types used in Paraview are uh, uh, meshes, and to our purposes, we are using a rectilinear grid, mostly uniform. This is just to say that Paraview is very popular in the academic, also government institutions. When you think about Paraview, you just think about the small client application. In reality, Paraview is um, a tall stack of libraries, and uh, VTK is the core provides all uh, functionalities for doing your uh, visualization and volume rendering. Concerning Python, Paraview comes with PVPython, which is a nice application which allows you to automate your task and uh, um, make your Python scripting for visualization. So this is the graphical user interface. Basic three steps when you visualize your data, reading, filtering, and rendering. As most of um, GUI has a, a menu bar with, the most, uh, uh, with all the features included in Paraview, a toolbars with the most common features used for visualize, visualizing your data, a pipeline uh, browser where a collection of a pipeline object with uh, um, in, in then, indented syntax is, pr um, is uh, presented. You can uh, have a look inside your data or um, your pipeline collection and change parameters in the inspector or um, properties panel, of course, an help, and finally, a 3D uh, viewing. So you are, probably you're wondering why I'm talking about Paraview in a Python uh, conference. If you look at this plot, which is a uh, isosurface of my uh, simulations done with PyNX, behind these plots there is a Python scripting, essentially. So you set up your camera and your parameters, change your parameters, you use all the filters you need to apply contour plot, uh, thresholds, or whatever, and finally you visualize your data. This is just a collection of filters you may want to apply. A connection of all these, what? Sorry. A collection of all these uh, filters gives you a pipeline object. I'm using for my ordinary work just three of them. For, ex for instance, I'm on the right, I want to make a contour plot of my data, and then I want to, for instance, make a isosurface um, extractions by just looking at a range of uh, values. I can also inspect in the data opening a spreadsheet 
uh, browser. And <coughs> you can make a query on your data according to some threshold criteria. So let's say I want to extract for all my data just the cells or the grid points according to some of my criteria. And also you have this uh, uh, nice feature by clicking and dragging on your viewing to select the data you are interested. So I'm going to conclude with the next task we, are, um, we want to address. If you are interested in looking for some sub-volumes in your Fourier space, let's call some spot, you want to identify these uh, spots, measuring angles and distances, and iteratively pass to the data drivers in order to improve uh, their atom probe uh, tomography uh, reconstructions. And so Paraview and Python, it's very uh, useful for addressing this task. And thank you for your kind attention. We have time for questions. Um, hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, you say that you use your direct Fourier transform because um, your atoms are not equispace, right? You're not dealing with perfect crystals. Uh, have you, you tried to use the non-uniform fast Fourier transform, which doesn't require you to have an equispaced grid? No, I, I haven't used and I wasn't aware, honestly, of the, this uh, All right. package. All right. Have a look at it. <laughs> But uh, in terms of performances, you get this. I mean, here you are using uh, the benefit of using GPU. Can you run this non equidistant? So the, the non uniform, it actually runs on top of uh, fast Fourier transform, mm -hmm. but it's actually a mathematical theorem that lets you go from an equispace grid to a non equispace okay. grid. In terms of computational. Uh, it is n log n as fast as the fast Fourier transform. So as far as I know, um, there's been, uh, there's a lot of software used in crystallography that has, that has been around for decades. And when I started, crystallographers uh, were using uh, computers that are mostly unknown today, like SGI, silicon graphics machines. Um, are you aware of any uh, integration um, of the things uh, that you do with software that has been used by crystallographers more traditionally? The only thing I know is this integration with the crystallography. Could you speak, could you speak oh, Sorry. The only thing I am aware is the integration of Pionix tool with the external library computa crystallo crystallography computational toolbooks for making other scientific tasks like, I don't know, um, computing grassing, grassing uh, incidents or use it in this uh, difficult to pronounce it, tychography technique and so on. So this is the only thing I'm aware of that. Okay. Any, any other questions? Then let's thank the speaker again.